in men are now able to join sororities news, a Wyoming sorority says they won't back off a transgender lawsuit. So a sorority admitted men to a sorority because the men called themselves women, which apparently is a thing now. So men in my sorority, it's more likely than you can think. And every man is suddenly thinking to themselves, you know, joining a sorority sounds like that might be an interesting idea. There's no way that can possibly go wrong that we can foresee, right? So anyway, some sorority members are suing, saying, you know, this violates their rights too. So we got a little conflict. The sorority says, men can join our sorority. This, these six members say, you know, how about women only? Let's get started with this. Six women are suing their sorority for allegedly breaking their own rules to admit a transgender member, delivered a fiery retort Wednesday in response to sorority calling the lawsuit frivolous and the transgender member calling it vicious. The people who are suing filed responses Wednesday against both Kappa Kappa Gamma, sorority, which typically means women only, but, you know, not so much, and its Wyoming chapters, first transgenders inductee, a guy who is called Artemis Langford. The plaintiffs say it's unclear why, when a large man pushes his way into an all-female space, the women who object to it are bullies. So yeah, we got this right. We got this sorority being incredibly woke to the point that they're literally letting a fox in the hen house, or six of them, or no, one of them rather, the six women are the ones suing. And it's like, oh, you are being a bully to the transgender. It's like, but female only spaces though, and this is not a this is not a woman. This is not a woman. The women are apparently being labeled attention-seeking liars. Wow, harsh. An old playbook from our history when women call out the men who force themselves and their privacy, the document continues. But times have changed. Women must no longer be silent victims to men who attempt to play by their own set of rules. Dude, this isn't the men who did this. This isn't the men who came up with these rules. This is women who came up with these rules. I think I could be wrong, but it seems to me, and correct me if you disagree, but this seems to be more of an outgrowth of feminism. And women who are like, we have to be more inclusive, more inclusive. I don't think it was really the men, for the large part, who were talking about, you know, let's let men be women and women be men. I think it was more women who who were doing that. And then men who perhaps take, took advantage of it. But I don't think it was men who fundamentally changed the rules. I think it was women who's like, let's open up all the things. No, not like that. Both the sorority and the person involved in the case asked the Wyoming District Court to dismiss the lawsuit against them. The sorority, its president, and a Wyoming-based sorority housing corporation argued the court doesn't have jurisdiction over the sorority present. The sorority can ad adjust its admission criteria as the definition of woman evolves. <laughs> and plaintiffs allegedly didn't work with sorority leadership enough before suing. Wow. So yeah, this is this is a this is fun, right? So what is happening here, it seems, based on the reporting, is that the sorority has a rule that only women can join the sorority, which, you know, kind of makes sense. Sororities have rules. They have rules. And one of the rules is you got to be a chick to join the sorority. Yeah. And they're over here like, well, this isn't a chick. And then the response is, we have changed the definition of check, chick. Pray we don't change it any further. You know, we wrote, we wrote women, but the definition of woman is evolving. Is it though? Is the definition of woman evolving? We've had the same definition of woman basically for all of history, but now it's evolving. Wow. What amazing times we live in. The sorority has gone so woke. It is, it is it come out its own backside. It's amazing. Langford claims the women don't have a reason to include the inductee's name in their lawsuit. And the lawsuit's complaint is so long and confusing, it's an unfair burden. Wow. That's an interesting complaint. The lawsuit is too detailed. That, that's an interesting one, right? Because normally you kind of get the other thing the other way around. Like there's not enough detail. So I don't know what I'm being sued over here. And they're like, there's no reason to mention the transgender woman in the lawsuit. I can think of some reasons, you know? 
but you know, we don't want to do this. The women responded Wednesday in a separate filing to both motions and asked the judge the lawsuit to continue. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. They, it, yeah, it seems like, you know, a breach of the understanding of the agreement, right? So when I joined the organization, I was under the impression it would be women only. And I had the definition of women that literally everyone had up until about five seconds ago. And now the definition of women has changed and you haven't changed the rules. And so you were kind of like changing what I joined. So, yeah. The women rejected both of Langford's arguments, saying they need to be in include the inductee in the lawsuit because its outcome could affect the membership. Fair enough, right? This guy is certainly an interested party, right? So it's like, yeah, we, we brought him into the lawsuit because their rights, his rights are being actively impacted by this. He is a necessary party in a literal sense, in a legal sense, he's a necessary party because our adjudication would impact him. And he is a required party in this case because he would not be able to justify, he would not be able to rectify his own rights after the fact. So when we're talking about this from a legal perspective, when we're talking about joinder of parties, you know, who needs to be part of this lawsuit? There's permissible joinder and there's mandatory jo joinder. And again, I'm talking under the federal rules, but I imagine that most states are basically the same because most states model themselves over the federal rules if no other reason. So it's like, okay, joinder is all about who can or who must be in a case, right? Who has to be here? That's joinder, right? Or we want to bring multiple different people into the case because they're related enough. So what, what are the rules? Well, basically permissible joinder is where they are similar enough that they could be adjudicated at the same time. So permissible joinder, if you like, is basically small class action, very small, right? There's a small number of people involved. Their, their complaints are all relatively the same, common facts, common law, and we can adjudicate them all at one time, right? We don't necessarily have to. We could adjudicate them one by one by one, but in the name of efficiency, we want to bring them all together. And that's permissible joinder, right? So there's a defined limited group of people, you know, a handful of people, maybe a little bit more, you know, there's a handful of people we want to bring into this lawsuit. Each of them, each of them independently has a claim. We could adjudicate them one at a time, but they're common enough in fact and law that we want to bring them all together. That's permissible joinder. Mandatory joinder, which this is much more equivalent to, is where a third party's rights are being impacted in a way that they cannot separately adjudicate. So I am suing the sorority in this situation, if you're the woman, I'm suing the sorority. That impacts this third person's rights. Okay, do they have to be here? Yes, they do, why? Because the outcome of this case directly impacts their interests and it impacts their interests in a way that they cannot rectify later. Because if the court rules for me, if the court rules for me and says the sorority did it bad, the remedy is kick the guy out. And then the guy has no recourse. He has no recourse because he can't then sue the sorority because that was just adjudicated, right? That was just adjudicated. That was the whole point. So he is a mandatory party. So yeah, the women are right. He They have to name him because this is mandatory joinder. He is a third party to their lawsuit, but he's a mandatory one because his rights are being impacted in a way that his ability to just to pre present his own interests would not be able to be solved if this case went forward. So the women are right, as you would expect. They are not asking for money. So they're just asking for basically declarative relief or an injunction. Some people say the filing must be part of a lawsuit because the court ruling may impede the party's ability to protect an interest. That's right. Without them in the lawsuit, the filing says a decision to void the membership could happen behind the person's back. Correct. Mandatory joinder, right? If I win, it voids their membership. Their membership is an interest they have. So they probably would want to, you know, protect their rights. So the only way to do them is to drag them into this lawsuit. So, yep, yeah, that makes sense. Langford's June 20th filing accuses the women of filing dehumanizing mud and attacking transgender people. Of course it is. Of course it is. Yep, this is just bigotry, right? That's the defense. 
This is bigotry. You're being a bunch of bigots. Why won't you let the men into the sorority? The inductee also claims the complaint is long and confusing and too cumbersome. Too much detail is a strange complaint. The woman's filing acknowledges her complaint is long, but argues it gives relevant and well-organized facts. So they decided to provide factual information in their plea, maybe in a way that was not required, right? So at least under the federal rules and most states, okay, we have no displeading. Like, we don't have to give facts. But just because we don't have to doesn't mean that we can't. We can, it's just not required. So most attorneys won't do it, although some will. And in this particular case, they're like, we want to put all the facts, or at least all the facts that justify our thing, out in the open, up front, because we want to make things clear so that we, you know, because this is so political and so hot button, you know, if someone reads this complaint, we want to make sure that they understand all the factual basis and they don't have to necessarily guess. So this attorney, it seems, went a little bit out of their way to include more details as a uh, saving measure you know, and also make things a little bit more fun. They're like, and, the, and they're actually complaining that they've been given specific pleading. That's an interesting one. Respectfully, the argument seems to reflect anger at the allegations made about the conduct, not about ambiguity. That sounds right. The lawsuit complaint lists numerous issues with Lamford allegedly leering, gawking, luring, and intimidation while in the security, while in the sorority house or around them, and many witnesses joining the lawsuit. We can't help noticing that this, this, this man who is in our sorority house seems to be uh, leering and uh, looking at the women in, in a way that seems inappropriate. Langford allegedly has, while watching members enter the sorority house, had an erection visible throughout his leggings. Yep, that is a, um, that's a woman, guys. It's a woman with a penis. Uh-huh. Other times he has a pillow in his lap. The allegations are relevant as underlying explanations, the women say. Yeah, I think so. Plaintiffs are living the reality of Langford's biological sex differences. When a 6'2 person who weighs 260 pounds and has, that's a strange woman, man. That is a strange woman. When a 6'2 person who weighs 260 pounds and has benefited from male puberty sits in the sorority dining room, staring and scowling at the young woman who filed a complaint with this court, that moment is not just a disagreement among us girls. That angry glare is a threat, a threat made possible by the man's superior size and strength. Wow, biology actually exists. Film at 11. The sorority's arguments are also invalid, the women allege. They reiterate that they're asking Kappa Kappa Gamma to follow its own bylaws and founding documents recognizing it as a single sex organization. Because, you know, when the sorority was founded and up to like five seconds ago, it was for women. That was the point. It was an all-female organization. Like fraternities are all-male organizations. That is what they are for. That is what they are for. And so it's like, okay, and now you're letting men into this space. That kind of destroys a little bit about what the sorority was supposed to be. Kappa Kappa Gamma is about 150 years old and historically been an organization for women. The lawsuit involves breach of contract for sorority alleged disregard towards own governing documents. Yeah, you know, we we came into your organization on the basis of your bylaws, which are 150 years old, which said just women. That's why we joined it. We wanted it to ju just be women, just for the girls. And you're going and 150 years ago when you wrote women, you meant women. And 145 years ago, it still meant women. But now you think it means men because it's an evolving definition. We think that's some bullshit. The women claim the rather unremarkable right as members of the corporation to insist the corporation follows its own bylaws. Yeah. A nonprofit organization's bylaws form a contract with its members, and members are within the right to sue when the organization breaks its word. Sounds about right. All right. The bylaws are part of the organization. They are part of the agreement of the organization. So we have a right to insist as members of the organization that you uphold your own rules for the organization. So, yeah, Kappa has argued the organization can evolve along with the word woman, which the group believes to be more inclusive now than 150 years ago. Uh-huh. So the definition of woman has changed. Kappa Kappa Gamma is over here like, this is a woman now. 
when we wrote woman 150 years ago, that, that contemplated the definition of the word woman changing over time. Uh-huh. Sure it did. And the definition of woman has changed. So we can admit the women now, which are men. Uh-huh. The women who are suing say the court does have jurisdiction over the president. In an effort to show the president's involvement in the injury, they cite past communications with sorority headquarters indicating the president was aware of the woman's qualms against the man, even in induction, but the sorority allegedly broke its own rules to induct them anyway. So she is part, you know, as the president of the organization, you know, she is part of determining what it helps the organization and she is defying the organization. So yeah, that seems like she might be able to be sued for her part in not upholding the organization's role. So being elected president of your sorority might actually come with legal consequences. Wow, amazing. The president of the sorority has argued they've never been to Wyoming and didn't direct any wrongful actions toward the state. So they're like, you don't have personal jurisdiction over me. I'm president of the entire sorority, all of it. I've never been to Wyoming. I haven't directed anything into Wyoming. I'm not sure about that, my friend. This is your chapter in Wyoming. This is your chapter. You are the president of the entire sorority. And you basically authorized this, the allegation is, in Wyoming. So you've never been to Wyoming, but the tort, or in this case, breach of contract, because breach of contract is not tort, but whatever. In this case, your actions do directly reach into Wyoming. So yeah, I think we have personal jurisdiction over you. The women's filings say they are because they are suing on behalf of the sorority, by alleging the sorority's actions are harming the organization itself, they can sue the president of the sorority from the state in which the alleged injury happened. Courts do not ignore where the injury was actually felt, said the filing. That's true. Now, where the injury is felt is not itself legally sufficient. We covered this, for example, in the Toddy case, right? Where the injury happened goes to standing to file the lawsuit but doesn't necessarily go to the ability to bring any particular defendant into the action. When we're thinking about the defendant and thinking about their thing, we're thinking not about standing, but we're thinking about due process. Here, the chapter is in Wyoming. She is the president of the entire organization. The chapter in Wyoming admitted this man to the chapter, apparently with the approval of the president of the entire sorority. So her actions directly reach into Wyoming. So I think we got personal jurisdiction on this one. In response to the sorority's claim that the women didn't work with the organization enough before suing, which I'm not even 100% sure what that means, by the way, because in a breach of contract claim, you don't necessarily have to work with the other side. You certainly can, but you don't have to. If the other side is in breach, you can just sue because they're in breach. You, you, you don't have to work with them. You can just be like, you're in breach. This, this isn't an administrative agency. This is a private party. You don't have to work with them. I don't even know what that means. The women accuse the sorority of misrepresenting their efforts and ignoring their pleas. The sorority's argument, the women claim, misses the extent to which the plaintiffs, their parents and attorneys asked for months for actions by Kappa. And that women and the parents started raising concerns as early as September. Also, I'm not sure that any of those things were legally required anyway. So I don't know what they're really talking about, but okay. The sorority argued last month that it can dictate the terms of membership under the constitutional right of free association. The women say it can, but not without following corporate law. Yeah, that's right. That's correctly, that's 100% correct. Yes, the sorority can choose its membership terms. That's 100% correct. They absolutely can. They're a private organization. They can, but they actually have to go about doing it in a way because they're a corporate entity. And being a corporate entity comes with some obligations to go through a particular process, particularly when you're talking about bylaws of an organization. They have to be changed according to the rules that are in place. They can do it, but they haven't done it. They haven't changed their bylaws. They're simply trying to say our bylaws mean something different than they clearly mean. So the women, again, are right. Does the sorority have a free association? Sure. Can they become co-ed? Sure. But they haven't actually done it. That's the problem. 
The plaintiffs are not arguing that Kappa could never admit a man, transgender or otherwise, but Kappa must follow its own bylaws, which should not permit the membership unless the bylaws are changed. That sounds exactly right to me. That sounds exactly right. Do you want to become a co-ed organization? Okay, you can do that, but you actually have to do it by actually changing the bylaws. And you're just trying to go around it, which you can't do that. You can't do that. So I think the women seem like they're pretty strong in their cause of action. Thus, that brings us to the end of the case of the Wyoming sorority, where six women are suing the sorority for saying the sorority broke its own bylaws that are 150 years old that say only women. Because, of course, it said only women. It's a sorority. It's only women. But they're like, this is a man with a penis, but they say they're a woman. So they're a woman now. They're 6'2 and 230 pounds, but that's totally a woman. And, we, and we're going to admit them to the sorority, and they get to be in the sorority house around with the other women. Uh-huh. And the women over here are like, but that breaks the bylaws. And the sorority is trying basically every trick in the book. You're a bunch of bigots. You're a bunch of fascists. What are you doing? The women over here are like, but you're not obeying your own rules. And based on the article, it looks like the women have a pretty good case. The corporation, the entity that is the sorority as a corporate entity, has a bylaw that says only women. They can change that bylaw, but they haven't changed the bylaw. They're simply trying to say that the, the term woman, which is basically 150 years old, means men now. And that doesn't work. And the women are like, we've been harmed because you're not obeying your own rules. And we are bringing the transgender man into this because we have to, because their rights are being impacted directly by our course of action. So that's mandatory joinder. And we brought a lot of details in the lawsuit because we wanted to make sure our factual basis was clear. We didn't have to do specific pleading, but we did. And you're complaining about the specific pleading, which is really weird. So the women look like they're on a pretty good track over here. It'll be an interesting case to try to follow. But at least for the moment, that brings us to the end of the discussion of this case.